Hi everyone and welcome to Umberus does the complete roguelike story all in Python using libdcode. This is part 12 and 13 and the final episode of the series. After that, you're on your own. Last week we expanded the dungeon map and implemented the character progression with a level up system and a character screen. Now this week we're going to tie up a few loose and we're going to do a little bit of game design and balancing and we're going to try to tweak our levels so that the difficulty increase as you get deeper into the dungeon. And in part 13, we'll add one final piece of the puzzle for a roguelike and that's going to be equipping stuff like swords and armor and helmets and rings and stuff like that. And when we'll be done with this, I think we'll be able to call this a pretty complete roguelike, if a little bit maybe simple. <laughs> Now part 12 deals with balancing the game's difficulty. Now that our player can level up, he'll quickly outpace the difficulty of the monsters, so it makes sense to adjust our randomizer to be a little bit more intelligent, if you will. Let's start by creating a couple of methods to help us make this randomizer a little bit more intelligent. And since these methods could be useful maybe outside the map generation, we'll take these methods and move them into a random utils.py script. So basically what we used to do is roll a number between 0 and 100 and divide the space between the various item we want to spawn. Now the problem with this technique is that we have to make sure that the probability of all items combined always give us 100%. And this is fine when you have a few items, like 4 or 5, but when you have a thousand items and you want to add one more, you're going to have to rebalance the probability of everything. And God forbid that you make a mistake and end up with 110%. Now there's a very nice solution to this. We call this using weights. In the method we're creating called random choice index, instead of rolling a dice between 0 and 100, we're going to give each item a weight and roll a dice between 0 and the sum of all weights. And then we are going to go through our list of weights and return the index of the first item that's above the total weight that we roll. But returning just an index would be a little bit boring, so instead what we're going to do is create yet another method called random choice from dict, and we're going to map the returned index to one of the dictionary keys instead. And you'll see how we're going to use that in the next part. Because next, we're going to go back to our good old place entities method in gamemap.py and we're going to import our new random utils method so we can replace the rand int method we were using with our new utils. And first, we're going to create the dictionary with all the drop rates and item names and weights that we want to spawn in our level. Basically, the way weights work is that if two items have the same weight, they have the same chance to drop in the level. And if the sum was, for example, to be 100, then we'd have exactly the same thing as what we had before. The thing is, is this time it doesn't have to be 100. It could be 1,000 or 10,000 or a million. It doesn't matter. It's all relative. If one item has double the weight of another, it means that it's twice as likely to drop irrespective of everything else. And once this dictionary is done, we can replace the awkward random method with the result of our random function using our new dictionaries for both the enemy spawns loop and the item drop loop. And next, we are ready to start changing the drop table and weights based on the dungeon level. For this, we'll go back into randomutils.py and add a new from dungeon level method that will take an array of values and dungeon level pair and return the value closest to our current dungeon level. Then back in place entities, we'll start changing the drop chance and monster spawn rate based on the current dungeon level. That means that instead of having hard-coded values coming from the constants configuration dictionary, we'll code them right in there. Honestly, I think we should have just changed the configuration to pass an array instead of passing like the single value and hard coding it in our method. But for the sake of simplicity and staying true to the tutorial, we'll just do it their way. For example, 
looking at monster chances, the area here that we're passing is saying the weight for trolls is going to be zero from dungeon level zero to two, it's then going to be 15 points from level three to four, and 30 from level five to six, and then 60 above level seven. This means if you take into account the uh, drop chance for the orc, that at level zero, we are never going to see a troll, but at level seven and above, we're going to have about 43% trolls in our dungeon. We do something similar to the item drop chance and make powerful scrolls unlikely to drop in the upper dungeon floors, but uh, more likely in the lower dungeon. Now, because we've made the configuration for the max number of entities in a room and the max number of items in a room part of our dungeon evolution, we have to remove these constants from the declaration of place entities, but since we're removing them here, it means we have to go back up all the way, all the function calls, and remove the parameter we passed every single step of the way, all the way to the configuration and constants that we set up in the previous episode, and then we can remove this there too. And once that's done, we can run a few tests, because it's not only important to test, but also test thoroughly. At first, it looks like things are working, but then moving to the next floor triggered a crash because I forgot to clean some of the constants. And then I got a few more crashes as I got deeper into the dungeon, but now finally I think that I've fixed most of the issues and everything looks like it's working fine. Now before calling this section done, let's try doing some game balancing, which is a very important step in game design. Right now our dungeon is kind of easy and there isn't much difference between trolls and orc, so even though trolls are gonna show up more in later levels, there's still not much of an issue, especially for a leveled up character. So let's reduce the player's damage output and its resistance so that he has to rely more on potions in the early game. I'm not aware of any magic trick to know how to balance a game properly beside trial and error, but still, right now, damages are not randomized, so you can kind of infer some useful data. For example, before you could kill an orc in two hit, because we were doing five damage and orcs had 10 HP. Now we do four damage and the orcs have 20 HP, which means that it takes five hits to kill them. Now orcs do four damage, but the player has one resistance, so the player takes three damage each turn, which means that it'll take 34 rounds for a single orc to kill the player. But another way you could see it is that it takes six orcs to kill the player, since it takes him five turns to kill one orc, he's going to be killed by the sixth orc he attacks. Unless, of course, he gets attacked by multiple enemies at the same time, or he meets an ugly troll, or quaffs some potions. Still, thinking about it in different ways like this can help you make things balance and help you spot cases where the fight might be just plain unfair. For example, at power 8 and defense 2, trolls can kill a first level player in 15 turns, but it'll take the player 30 turns to kill the troll. So if a level 1 hopes to survive a troll encounter, he better have some trick up his sleeve, like maybe a scroll of confusion or some potions or something like that. Now I think the game is still a bit easy, but there's only so much you can do with two monsters and four items. At least now you have to be a little bit more careful if you don't want to get killed. Alright, part 13, final stretch, let's add equipment for the player. Now remember when we added the inventory and the item component? Well, yeah, we're going to basically be doing exactly the same thing. First, to tell the game that an item can be equipped, we're going to create an equipable component and we're going to give it a few statistics like where this item can be equipped or what kind of bonuses this item is going to give the player. Right now, our character only has three attributes, HP, damage, and resistance, so our equipped item can only affect one of those attributes. Now we need a way to list all the places the player can put equipment, torso, hands, fingers, it's really up to you to list anything you want, but to make it easier we're going to put all of this into a new enum that we're going to call equipment slots. And to keep it simple for the tutorial we're just going to add main hand and off hand items. And after this you'll see it should be very easy to add as many as you want. Next, we need a way to keep track of the items a player has equipped. 
So just like the inventory component, we're going to create an equipment component to keep references to which items are on which body parts of the player. To apply the bonuses eventually of the equipped items to the player, we need some way of getting those values for the equipped item. So the best thing to do is to add a couple of utility methods in the equipment component to get the bonus values of all the equip items for each of those attributes. So we can use them later in the fighter component when we resolve combats. Again, we're going to use the at property decorator that we used in the previous episode. And in Python, this just means that the method is going to behave like a variable and you don't need to put parentheses. And it's just a pretty way of writing methods when there's no parameter to pass to them. Once we have our accessor, we need one last method to toggle equipment. This will be triggered when we hit a specific key to change our equipment. This is pretty straightforward. We receive the item we want to equip as a parameter. And if it's already equipped, we can remove it. If there was nothing at the place we want to equip it, we just equip it. And if there was something, then we first remove the previous item and then add the new item. A small difference here though, is that equipable components must also be stuff we can pick up in the dungeon. And to decide if an item can be picked up, it needs to have an item component. So we're going to do a little bit of a hack here. And if we have an equipment component, but we don't have an item component, we're going to create it on the fly to make sure that whatever item you can equip is also something you can drop and pick up in the dungeon. Now in NetHack, there's different keys for each piece of equipment you want to put for W for wielding a weapon, P for putting on rings, and uppercase W for wearing armor and stuff like that. But that's kind of complicated. We already have a UI for activating any item in our inventory. So we'll just go in our use inventory method and add a new condition that if an item has an equipment component, instead of calling the item function on this equipment, we're going to return the equip command and this way, we don't have to go messing around in menus or the endo input script. All we need to do is handle our new command in engine.py by calling the new toggle method we put in the equipment component and printing a few messages to tell the player what just happened. Now we have one more problem. The code doesn't care where the item we have equipped is. So if we drop the item, the player would still have a reference to it in its equipment. So we are going to fix this by going into the inventory component and making sure that we remove any item from the equipment component before dropping it from the inventory. And finally, time to apply the bonus from our equipment. This will be handled in the fighter component, but right now when we're resolving a combat, we're using the max HP, power and defense variables, but we don't want to go and have to refactor everything so we are going to rename the base attributes into base max HP, base defense and base power. And we're going to make properties method for calculating the base property plus the bonus from our equipment. The only place we have to update now is when we level up because we want to change the base values and not the calculated one. Now that everything is set up, we can add some swords and shields to our list of drops in the game map. Notice that we didn't have to change the previous weights, we just added some new ones for the shields and the sword. Now the shield of course will go in the off hand and the sword in the main hand. We're kind of keeping it simple here, but for example, the slot in the equipable component could be a list and the game could choose or prompt the player so he could for example equip a sword in his off hand at that point, really, you can do whatever you want. Right now, the player has a power of four and is basically a monk killing with his bare fists. So let's make this a little bit more realistic by lowering his power and adding a dagger as his starting equipment. Now we can't just add the component directly in the initialization since we need to also add it to the player's inventory. But that's fine because we already have methods for adding inventory and equipping items. So we'll just call them manually in the initialization and everything should work fine. Also, let's tell the player when he has some item equipped by updating our inventory menu to add some more text if an item is part of the player's equipment. 
And now we can test our game and we can see that everything is working. We can equip some items, we can drop them, we can change our equipment, try to find a shield and take less damage, level up our player and really all around it's a pretty fun game already. But it's also time to have some fun as a programmer. It's time to play around, add new monsters, add new items, add armors and helmets and powerful magical ring. You could even challenge yourself and try to add the concept of unidentified potions or maybe add some upstairs to go back to a previous level and see how you're going to serialize the previous levels. You could also try to implement a more complex combat system, maybe more than just three attributes. Maybe you can create some unique pre-generated rooms that you can spawn sometimes at special levels. You could even remake the whole story in a completely different styles. You could even try to replace scrolls with guns and make it a cyberpunk fantasy or maybe a space game like I'm doing. And this whole system could easily be used to make any kind of games. And you just need to change the turn-based system into a real-time strategy game and you'll be surprised what you can accomplish by keeping this component command architecture. And that's it for this week. It's the complete roguelike story hole. It was really fun to do. I hope you had some fun following along. And if you did, hit that like button. Please subscribe and see you all in my next episode. Bye! Thank you.